Um, hi, my name is Joanna Cohn. I'm director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I am so very honored and excited to introduce today's Innovations in Tobacco Control speaker, Dr. Janet Hoek. Janet Hoek is a professor of public health at the University of Otago well, in Wellington, New Zealand. She has a PhD in survey research, but don't let that fool you. She also does excellent qualitative research, and she has received several awards, both for her teaching and her research. Uh, Dr. Hoek's work has examined a range of tobacco policy topics, including plain packaging, tobacco retailing, uptake of smoking and e-cigarette use among young people and transitions from smoking to use of e-cigarettes. She um, has a number of leadership positions. She co-directs Aspire 2025, which is one of the University of Otago's research centers. She also co-directs two large research programs that support New Zealand's tobacco endgame strategies. One is funded by the Health Research Council and a second is funded by the New Zealand Cancer Society. And she is also a co-investigator on a new Australian synergy grant that will examine uh, tobacco endgames. Dr. Hoek is an elected fellow of the Australian and New Zealand Marketing Academy and the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, and she serves on several advisory groups and editorial boards. Now, Dr. Hoag is not just a wonderful person, but also cares deeply about this work. Uh, so much so that she is speaking with us today in the midst of a vacation she's taking with her husband. So thank you, Janet, so much for being here. And I am so much looking forward to your talk here at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. In our leadership programs, we talk about beyond imagination. And I'm excited uh, because that's exactly what you're talking about today. And um, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, for uh, such a lovely introduction and uh, for extending to me the honour of being part of your lecture series. So um, I will now share my screen and thank you very much. So as Joanna is, has very kindly said in her lovely introduction, what I would like to talk about is the end game that we are pursuing in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I've called my lecture Imagining Things Otherwise, and I'll explain the significance of that title in just a few moments. Um, first, just a few disclosures, um, particularly the fact that I've never received any industry funding. I am an advisor and member of some uh, end game collaborations, received external funding for my research and some honoraria. I really want to begin by acknowledging my colleagues, um, and you can see here a photo of just some of the members of the Aspire Centre. Uh, I'm really fortunate to work with the most inspirational group of colleagues. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our funders, uh, some of whom Joanna's already mentioned, and I'd especially like to acknowledge Ruth Malone. Um, so as I said, I would explain the significance of my title. Um, Ruth really inspired me when I was a much younger researcher, when I heard her speak and exhort us to imagine things otherwise. And I've always remembered that line of, of Ruth's because I think every single morning when we get out of bed, uh, we should be thinking about how we can do things otherwise and why we should never simply accept the status quo as a given. So I want to acknowledge Ruth for her work in inspiring me to try and think in that different way. And of course, for the enormous contribution that she's made to our field. Just by way of overview, what I'd like to do is to begin with a very brief history of the New Zealand endgame uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Aotearoa and how the endgame first evolved. And I would particularly like to acknowledge the leadership uh, shown by many members of the Māori community, academics, advocates and community workers, as well as, uh, of course, uh, as politicians, um, because they played a really pivotal role in introducing and fostering the endgame notion in Aotearoa. 
Then I'll talk a little bit about some of our core policies, which you can see represented here. So the idea of denicotinization, the large reduction in the retail availability of smoked tobacco products, and the smoke-free generation. Then finally, what I'd like to do is to think about some of the challenges that we're facing and share a little bit of information about those in the hope that that might be useful to those of you who are also planning end game strategies. So to start with a little bit of history, Aotearoa was originally a Tupika Kore nation, so that means that we were a tobacco free country and tobacco was introduced via colonization. Now what you can see in these wonderful paintings are two Māori kuia. So these, that means wise women, older women in iwi or tribes who carried traditional knowledge and shaped future generations. And the really important thing, of course, that you can see in both images are that these women are, are represented with pipes. Uh, which really shows the way in which tobacco infiltrated Māori society. Now, it wasn't simply an infiltration, uh, as you can imagine, that was innocuous. And what you can see in this graph here is an indication of smoking prevalence among different ethnicities in Aotearoa. Now, there are two key things that I hope you can see in this graph. And the first, of course, is that smoking prevalence has declined. So as I'm moving my cursor along, you can see that particularly from around 2019, 2020, smoking prevalence has declined. So I guess that's the first thing that you can see in the graph, and that's the piece of good news. But the second key thing that you can see is the difference between the lines. And you can see represented in the blue line, smoking prevalence among the Māori population, and here in the purple line, among the European other population. So I guess 10 years ago, um, or 2011, 2012, you can see that smoking prevalence was more than 20% higher among Māori than it was among non-Māori. We look at the most recent data, which were released just at the end of last year, we can see that smoking prevalence, the gap between the two ethnicities, has declined considerably. So in absolute terms, you can see that we've made some gains. But in relative terms, the story is not quite so good. And you can see that smoking prevalence, which was more than twice as high among Māori here, is still more than twice as high among Māori than non-Māori, even at the end of 2022. So of course, those figures were deeply concerning to all people, but particularly to Māori, because for a very long time, smoking has imposed this disproportionate burden of harm and ill health on Māori. And that's perhaps why it was Māori leaders who proposed the tobacco endgame vision that we're now pursuing in Aotearoa. And I'd especially like to acknowledge Shane Bradbrook, who you can see represented here, who was a leading Māori tobacco control advocate um, more than 20 years ago. Shane led uh, to write to Reo Marama, the, the Māori Smoke Free Coalition, and he launched the first of the denormalisation campaigns, in fact the only denormalisation campaign, and was among the first people to call out the tobacco industry as the cause of the harm that was being inflicted on the Māori population. So it was advocacy from Shane and others and his colleagues that saw the pivotal inquiry into the tobacco industry in Aotearoa that was led by Tau Hinari, who you can see in this image, but it was really Hone Harawera who spearheaded this campaign and was among the key uh, smoke-free advocates, and Hone is still deeply involved in the smoke-free movement today. Now, as many of you will know, it was this inquiry that led to the recommendation that we implement a tobacco endgame strategy in Aotearoa. So a select committee inquiry always makes a report to the government, the government has to respond, and the government did indeed respond. And you can see an excerpt from the government's report just here. So the government agreed with the, the goal of reducing smoking prevalence and tobacco availability to minimal levels 
thereby making New Zealand essentially a smoke-free nation by 2025. Now, as you can see, the Māori Affairs Select Committee report was dated November 2010. The government's response came out in 2011. So in 2011, more than 10 years ago, Aotearoa had a tobacco endgame goal. And you would think, what happened next? Well, the logical thing um, following the announcement of the goal would be to establish a plan. But unfortunately, that is not what happened. There was no plan. It was a deeply dispiriting time because we had largely business as usual measures and none of those involved any of the structural changes that we associate with real end game measures. Now, of course, that's not to say that nothing happened in Aotearoa, and you can see in this table that we did indeed have several important policies, but as I've said, none of these involved the kind of end game measures that were focusing on reducing smoking prevalence very rapidly in time to meet the 2025 goal. And in fact, very few of those measures actually prioritised Māori and did anything to address the, the health inequities that had really been responsible for the end game movement and the Māori Affairs Select Committee inquiry. So it's only some cessation services that were reoriented to prioritise Māori and some mass media campaigns. Uh, really very weak measures when you think about what could have been undertaken to reduce the inequities that I've shown you. So I guess we were stuck in step two for quite a long time, waiting for a miracle that was going to galvanise the kind of action that all of us knew was necessary if we were to achieve the 2025 goal. So what happened? Did we get our miracle? Well, there was a real turning point. Just three years ago, there was an election and we had a new minister responsible for tobacco. And you can see in this image, Dr. Aisha Beryl, who at that time uh, was appointed minister responsible for tobacco, but has since uh, been promoted and given the entire health portfolio. Not long after Dr. Verrill was appointed, uh, she organised the Ministry of Health, worked them hard, and saw them release an action plan. So that was only just a, over a year after her own appointment. So we had an action plan released, and just a year after that, this woman really works at speed. We had the pivotal legislation, the Smoke-Free Environments and Regulated Products Amendment Bill. And this is the legislation that introduces denicotinization, the retail reduction strategy, and the smoke-free generation. But if I just go back a step and explain the action plan, uh, it's important, I think, to realise that there are six key foci in the action plan. Now, three of those are non-legislative measures, but I just want you to look at the, the first of these, which is really a recognition that the strategies we've had in place have not worked equitably. They have not reduce that relative difference between Māori and non-Māori. So the first step in the plan is to ensure that we have Māori leadership at all levels. It's also to, to increase community mobilisation and to recognise that often communities are the groups that know what will work most effectively with their peoples. So it's a recognition that we need more bottom-up and fewer top-down strategies. The remaining three measures are the legislative components of the action plan, and it's this, these three measures that I'll talk about in more detail. Reducing the addictiveness and appeal of tobacco products, reducing the availability of smoked tobacco. I'll focus on those two areas. The sixth measure really introduces surveillance, monitoring and compliance mechanisms. So if I turn first to very low nicotine cigarettes, this is the measure that we see as being absolutely pivotal, and I'll explain why in a couple of moments. Denicotinization is going to apply to all smoked tobacco products. 
And it's interesting, I found this old media clip. You can see it's dated 2012. It is reporting on work that was undertaken uh, by Dr. Natalie Walker from the University of Auckland, who undertook some of the first trials in Aotearoa looking at the impact low nicotine cigarettes would have. So 10 years later, Natalie's work is now the basis of our legislation. All smoked tobacco products are going to require approval before they can be sold in Aotearoa. And as I've mentioned, there's going to be a testing regime and compliance mechanisms to show that products meet the standard. And we're currently undergoing consultation on regulations that will specify exactly what that standard will be. Now we know that denicotinization was really tobacco companies' worst nightmare. The legislation that was introduced in Aotearoa uh, was really not a good day in the office for tobacco companies internationally, but it's denicotinization that has them really feeling alarmed. And we can see why in this quotation from an internal industry document from 60 years ago, to lower nicotine too much, might end up destroying the nicotine habit in a large number of consumers and prevent it from ever being acquired by new smokers. There's very strong logical and theoretical support for this measure, as well as the industry's own inside knowledge. If tobacco is no longer addictive, people wouldn't have the cravings that they experience now to continue smoking, and they wouldn't be rewarded each time they lit up a cigarette. We know that there's very strong evidence from findings in the trials, such as those undertaken by Natalie and in the US by Eric Donnie and many of his colleagues. So people given uh, VLNCs or very low nicotine cigarettes in trials smoked much less. They were exposed to fewer toxins, but more importantly, in many respects, they were much more likely to try and quit and they were more likely to be successful in those quit attempts. Now, this is the evidence that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is modeling work that was undertaken, uh, led by Nick Wilson, a colleague at the University of Otago, and Tony Blakely, now at the University of Melbourne. And you can see here the extraordinary impact that they anticipate denicotinization having, having. So you can see the solid red line, smoking prevalence among Māori, but look at the dotted red line to see how that plummets once denicotinization has been introduced or how it's predicted to plummet once denicotinization has been introduced. And that's the same for every ethnicity. And we can see those effects occur across male and female. So introducing denicotinization with C, the 2025 goal achieved for non-Māori and very soon after 2025 for Māori. When they modelled the combined interventions, you can see that there is not much change to the graph that I showed you earlier. And that illustrates just how pivotal denicotinization is to rapidly reducing smoking prevalence. Now, it's very important that we look not only at general population statistics, but also at vulnerable groups that may exist within the general population. And there's been some important work undertaken by Jonathan Folds and his colleagues, which suggests that groups with high smoking prevalence will benefit most from this policy. So they studied the impact of denicotinization using trials with people experiencing poor mental health and also people who didn't experience high material well-being. And importantly, what they found was that people in these, these trials didn't increase their smoking, they didn't experience increased stress, and they didn't turn to other drugs to make up for the reduced nicotine that they were experiencing. Now, the next measure that I'll turn to is the reduction in the, the availability of smoked tobacco products. And what you can see here is an image of a convenience store, and there are many of these throughout Aotearoa. The retail reduction measure 
uh, says that tobacco is only going to be permitted to be sold by organised retailers. Now, in Aotearoa, we have a ban on the point of sale display of tobacco products, but you can see in this large cabinet here behind the retailer, this is where the smoked tobacco products are stored. So these can only be sold by authorised retailers, and the number of those retailers is going to reduce dramatically. We don't have a licensing or even a registration system in place at the moment, but our best guess is that there are about 6,000 shops selling smoked tobacco products throughout the country. That number will decrease to 600 as a maximum. And the other measure that's going to be incorporated as part of the retail reduction strategy is an emphasis on avoiding concentrations of retail outlets, particularly in areas that experience higher deprivation. So the Director General of Health is going to designate maximum number of stores, and as I mentioned, it's currently set at 600, but we are recommending that that number decrease over time in line with the Māori Affairs Select Committee vision of reducing tobacco availability to, to absolutely minimal levels. Now, we are currently undergoing consultation on the regulation, so I don't have the exact details of what these will look like, but they are likely to include both density and proximity criteria. So we are hoping that there will be a minimum distance set between retailers and that outlets won't be able to be located near uh, schools or places where young people congregate and perhaps also places of cultural significance to Māori, such as marae. We are also recommending that anybody who is permitted to sell smoked tobacco products is also going to be required to provide cessation advice. That stores will have to meet security standards, uh, and you can see here a supermarket image. Um, supermarkets are typically more secure stores than the smaller dairies you can see above. They have bollards, they may have in-store security staff. It's much more difficult to ram raid or steal tobacco from a supermarket than it is from a smaller retail outlet. And the final requirement that we are recommending very strongly is that these stores will, will have to supply monthly sales data on every brand, every variant and every price point. And that will enable close monitoring of how each of the strategies that have been put in place is affecting smoking prevalence and purchase of smoked tobacco products. The rationale for reducing the supply of tobacco uh, products in this way, again, is, is very strong. It recognises the anomaly that we're selling tobacco as though it's an ordinary consumer product, when in fact it is anything but an ordinary consumer product. We know from uh, studies, uh, systematic reviews, that reducing access is associated with decreased youth uptake. So the less available tobacco is to young people, the less likely they are to experiment with smoking. We also know that for people who smoke and who are taking that difficult journey to become smoke free, that if we remove temptation, that journey to becoming smoke free is easier and the likelihood that people will relapse is reduced. We also know that the policy really gives us an opportunity to try and address some of the inequities that we know are currently uh, being experienced by people living in communities that experience higher deprivation. So I just want to show you a map of Aotearoa, New Zealand. The red dots that you can see represent tobacco retail outlets. And as I've mentioned, these are strongly concentrated in neighbourhoods that experience higher deprivation. So this is some work that was undertaken by a colleague, Louise Marsh. You can see these numbers along the bottom uh, represent uh, deprivation deciles or the New Zealand Deprivation Index. So one is low, 10 is high. So you can see how areas of higher deprivation also have greater number numbers of tobacco retail outlets. So this strategy is really likely to reduce health inequities. Now, of course, a strategy like this is not going to go unchallenged and there has been very strong opposition from small retailers 
and some of the industry groups that represent smaller retailers, such as the dairy and business owners group. Uh, they have expressed strong concerns that a measure uh, that will prevent some of them from selling smoked tobacco products is going to threaten their vi financial viability, see businesses close and lead to a downturn in particular sectors of the economy. And you, as you can imagine in economies that are trying to resurrect themselves in what we hope is a post-COVID era, uh, these are difficult political arguments to try and counter. This is uh, a comment from one of the submissions made by the Dairy and Business Owners Groups. They said it rips the guts out of an important source of football. For many businesses, it will destroy their viability. So we demand that the ministry explain how they're going to compensate retailers who are unable to meet their financial obligations. So these are really strong words, and these words repeat, were repeated uh, by many small retailers. But I just want to share a different view. This was a supermarket owner who also made a submission. He said, tobacco's a loser category. It's got no volume growth. It's got low stock owner, a stock turnover, and a very low gross profit margin. Tobacco companies, he wrote, keep this train wreck category afloat by offering retailers, uh, offering rebates, but only to retailers who comply with these draconian demands on how they allocate their space to brands, uh, who accept the pricing structure that's imposed on them by tobacco companies, and who organize their brands within those display units using a planogram specified by tobacco companies. The retailer went on to say the category only attracts a small percentage of the popula population. They're addicted. They don't buy very much when they go into the store. Basically, they are unprofitable customers. The margins are tightly controlled. They're only around 9%. That's an incredibly low profit margin uh, among retail outlets uh, selling grocery products. And he concluded, I don't want these products in my store. When I did a survey of my customers, more than 85% of them wanted us to get rid of them. So that's a bit of a reality check. But nonetheless, many small retailers presented a petition. And here you can see the New Zealand Parliament, uh, the deputy leader of the, the right-wing party represented in Parliament, the ACT Party. And they're standing on the footsteps of Parliament. She's holding a box of postcards that retailers from throughout the country have sent in. But who's in the background? Well, I guess there's only one explanation that's coming to mind. It was Big Tobacco that was behind this postcard protest. You can see here a close-up of one of the postcards with a British American tobacco sales rep um, calling card attached to it. So the tobacco industry has been motivating and supporting a lot of the opposition to the policies. We've done some work looking at footfall and we know that most purchases at convenience stores don't involve tobacco. It's a low margin product, as I've said. It accounts for only around 15% of transactions and only 5% of transactions overall involve both tobacco and non-tobacco products. Basically, it's a sunset product. The number of people smoking has declined dramatically. Sales to, of tobacco are falling. It's an unfortunate reality for retailers that they are going to have to get used to. People who smoke are also people who don't strongly support this policy. Of all the policies that are being implemented, this is the only one that has minority support. Uh, you can see here data from 2018. It's probably changed slightly, but there was still likely to be more opposition than support for this policy. I think we need to address this challenge head on. We need to emphasize that the policy will support people to quit and to recognize that most people who smoke actually want to become smoke free. But we do need to enhance cessation support and ensure that these people don't simply feel abandoned and stranded. And fortunately, as I've explained, that is exactly what the action plan proposes doing. 
This is some work that we've recently conducted, talking with people who smoke about how they will manage the retail reduction strategy. And as I said, it is something that they feel concerned about. As this person said, great for the younger generation, but people have been smoking all their lives. It's going to be really tough for them. It's going to affect their mental well-being, and it's going to make them pay more. It's going to be a financial burden because they'll have to travel further to buy tobacco. But they also foresaw benefits, and for many of them, when we talked to them about this policy, they became deeply reflective. They asked questions like, why do I put something to my body that's harming me? Surely this is the opportunity, the prompt, the stimulus that I need to make a quit attempt. And they saw huge benefits for younger people. As one participant said, it's all about the next generation breaking the cycle. It didn't happen during our time but let's make it better for them. And that is exactly what the smoke-free generation policy proposes doing. Now, there's a key difference between the smoke-free generation policy and increased age restrictions. That difference is the smoke-free generation recognises that there is never a safe age at which tobacco use can start. So it really challenges perceptions of smoking as a rite of passage. And it recognises tobacco as an innately harmful product, drawing on consumer safety arguments. So rather than saying people have a right to buy tobacco, it argues and recognises that people instead have a right to be protected from such an intrinsically harmful product. Now, modelling work, again undertaken by my colleagues, shows that this policy will be strongly pro-equity. You can see in the first red line that I'm showing the gap in smoking prevalence between Māori and non-Māori, and then what that gap is modelled to be following the introduction of the smoke-free generation. It's strongly pro-equity, and that's because Māori and Pacific peoples have a much younger population profile. It also has incredibly strong support. So you can see here around 80% of people uh, supported the smoke-free generation, and that was around 10% more than supported increased age restrictions. Now, the final area that I'd like to look at is some of the industry challenges. Now, we know that the industry has been claiming to have been transforming for some years now. So you would expect, logically, that they would be delighted with legislation that facilitated that process of transformation they claim to be undertaking. But let's look at what's happened. British American Tobacco, the largest tobacco company in New Zealand, said in one of its submissions, there is a very real risk that this action plan will drive demand, more sales of illegal tobacco, and more cash for criminals. A right-wing uh, group said we should be thanking people who smoke um, because they contribute so much to the tax revenue. Instead, we're making them miserable. I mean, that is such a repugnant argument to be making. And the illicit trade argument has reared its head time and time again. This is some work that my colleague uh, Lindsay Robertson did analysing submissions from BAT, Imperial Tobacco and Japan Tobacco. Philip Morris didn't make a submission. So BAT opposed strengthening the tobacco system. They, with Imperial, supported exist enhancing existing initiatives didn't like reducing retail availability, hated the smoke-free generation, opposed mandating BLNCs and prohibiting filters, didn't like uh, the idea that they couldn't innovate uh, tobacco products and also didn't like the minimum price. So for, in, for industries that claim to be unsmoking the world, uh, this was a remarkable lack of support for policies that would have facilitated and expedited that process. What are the key arguments that they bring forth? They say there's no evidence, the measures are unproven, they're incredibly risky. But in fact, we know from modelling, from surveys, from in-depth qualitative work, and from the implementation of the retail reduction strategy and smoke-free generation policies in other jurisdictions, that there is empirical support and real-life feasibility evidence. In fact, we know again and again that the tobacco industry will set standards of proof that it never meets itself. As I've said, illicit trade is an argument that comes up repeatedly. 
um, tobacco companies claim that government revenue is going to decline and that it's much better to use established supply routes because these are safer. Because if we use, uh, any, implement any of the policies that have been proposed, we're going to see gang power increase, uh, public safety and, and decrease and lawlessness increase. And the product itself, uh, I mean, astonishingly, they argue that the product will become unsafe. Goodness only knows what they think it is right now. And studies that we've done to try and assess illicit trade involving collection of discarded packaging, uh, we estimate that the prevalence of foreign packs at around 5%. And that estimate has stayed pretty stable over the last 10 years. We know that there are ways to deal with illicit trade, and that's through increased monitoring and enforcement, and by making nicotine available from other sources. That is exactly what's happening in Aotearoa. And the long-term solution, of course, is to uh, reduce illicit trade by ensuring that smoking prevalence continues to decline. The best solution is to implement the policies set out in the legislation as quickly and as effectively as possible. Attacks on freedom are also common arguments, but what does the evidence say? I mean, when we look at the evidence, people who smoke support reducing nicotine. They strongly support very low nicotine cigarettes, and that's because there's such high levels of regret among people who smoke and strong intentions to quit among many. This policy is not attacking freedom. It is not prohibiting tobacco. It is actually supporting people's aspirations rather than removing their choices. I think what tobacco companies have also tried to do is to shift the focus away from health and into more philosophical areas. So very low nicotine cigarette rules are sufficiently binding to make smoking unpalatable amount to prohibition. But as I've said, this is not prohibition. Nicotine is still available via other sources. Smoking is certainly not a lifestyle choice. It's driven by addiction and cravings. These arguments only apply to normal products and not to a lethal product like tobacco. So I think if we take these arguments head on, we can say they are simply wrong on every count. The attack on freedom argument has also come up in relation to the smoke-free generation. And tobacco companies argue that this policy is going to remove young people's choices. But in actual fact, it's them and their products that remove young people's choices. So it's the product and not the policy that is going to circumscribe freedoms. And when we talk to young people, we saw that they had a deep understanding of how we sometimes need policy regulation constraint if we are to enjoy freedoms. So these are some comments when they reflected on the smoke-free generation. They said it's better for everyone on the wider scale for the future. We should be thinking about these bigger implications. It's actually the government's role to keep you safe. They're not supposed to make things available that are going to harm you. And one of them, one young woman who smoked said, actually, you've got no choice either way. It's better for the government to step in and regulate and protect people than it is to allow people to lose their choice through smoking. We had only a very small minority in our sample who disagreed with the smoke-free generation and thought that people should not be protected from themselves by laws. So what are the implications of some of these arguments? I think the implications are really that we must challenge industry discourse. I mean, unsmoking the world, as tobacco companies claim, actually means that they should be supporting the legislation and the policies that that legislation contains. The right to autonomy is actually the right to being free from addiction. So I think that we have huge opportunities to hold the tobacco industry to account and to expose the flaws and the reasoning that they're trying to advance to oppose each of these measures. So in conclusion then, um, the three measures that are outlined are absolutely key to New Zealand's end game goal. 
they may seem really challenging. I mean, goodness knows, until Dr. Verrill became our health minister, we certainly saw the implementation of these strategies as challenging, despite the logical, empirical and theoretical support that each one of them has. But the fact that we are pursuing an end game in Aotearoa shows that it is possible. And if I can come back to Ruth's quote, we really should imagine things otherwise and dare to dream. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if you want to get in touch with me about anything, I've put my email address there. Um, though, as Joanna said, I'm on leave at the moment and won't be back until a little bit later this month. But I'll stop sharing now and I uh, am really happy to take any questions. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Janet. That was um, really terrific. And I'll ask um, our audience members, and thank you so much uh, for joining us live. Um, it's great to see the rain people from all over. Um, from your home country from like we, yeah we've got participants from all over which is fantastic so please if you have any questions or comments put them in the q a box and um i'm I, let me just jump in with the first comment um so it says this person's asking if you can talk a little bit more about new zealand's approach to focusing on smoked tobacco products maybe you can just again to make sure that we understand what that includes and what it doesn't include when you say smoke tobacco products and then how you see things evolving as the tobacco industry will likely you know hopefully they'll fight they'll lose they'll they might switch to promoting um non-smoke tobacco products um so i don't know if you've had a chance things have moved quickly since you said the you know we got the plan finally um but um, I don't know if there's been thought yet put to um, how to minimize those second phase uh, harm. So um, why the focus on smoke tobacco, what that exactly is, and then um, thinking about how to address the, the second phase. Well, look, thanks. That's an absolutely fantastic question. So smoke tobacco products um, covers just cigarettes and roll your own tobacco and any other combusted tobacco products. So it would um, cover um, CREOs, which we don't have very many of in, in New Zealand, but it would cover those as well. Um, Thinking about the second uh, part of your question, which is you know, what attention have we given to um, second tier products that are being introduced? Um, this is an area where there is a great deal of debate, and I, I should probably say explain that I'm among the more conservative members of, of my research group, so I have very real concerns about the rapid increase that we've seen in use of vaping products, uh, particularly uh, among young people. I don't think that we have the balance right in Aotearoa between protecting young people and providing an alternative to people who have tried traditional means of reducing smoking and been unable to quit with those. And for those people um, moving to um, e-cigarettes or non-combusted tobacco products, um, is generally agreed to be a reduced harm option. So at the moment, the government is supporting the wider availability of those products. In the consultation on the regulations that are underway at the moment, they have introduced some additional or proposed introducing some additional restrictions on electronic cigarettes and other non-combusted products. In my opinion, those restrictions don't go anywhere near far enough. Great, thanks. Um, so again, I think people are, you know, thinking about how how can we do this in, in our in my jurisdiction and what, what might some of the challenges be. So there's a question about um, whether the Ministry of Health faced opposition from within the government, other ministries, often sort of sometimes um, the Ministry of Health is out on their own and doesn't have the um, uh, the uh, support from their ministerial colleague, their colleagues from other ministries. Um, and so um, I guess, you know, was the tobacco industry um, busy lobbying some of those other ministries? And because um, this is the problem often that that is is faced, 
as you are aware of. So maybe you can just talk about that. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, we've, um, or the, the Ministry of Health has been very mindful of the possibility of legal challenges. So my understanding is that they've li liaised very closely with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade to look at how they can ensure that they meet any obligations that they may have under trade agreements and other commercial treaties. Um, so there has been close collaboration there. Um, there have been some concerns raised about the impact on customs, particularly because of um, the, uh, I, I guess, the promotion of illicit traders like it, by the tobacco companies is something that we're likely to experience as a major problem. I don't think that that's now considered to be a major problem. We've worked quite hard through Nick Wilson's work on the PAC collection study uh, to explain why we don't think that illicit trade is going to be a huge problem. There's been an increased allocation of funding to ensure that we have stronger border security and monitoring. So I think, in fact, the different ministers and agencies have collaborated quite closely. It's difficult to know, of course, what kind of lobbying the tobacco industry has undertaken, but I don't think that it's, if, whatever it is that they've been saying privately, I don't think it's been sufficient to deter any of the actions. Um, what we saw in the action plan is pretty much exactly what we're seeing in the legislation. Thank you. And then we have a couple of questions about um, uh, reducing nicotine. Um, so a question about what the anticipated timeline would be for that. Um, and I assume it's not a gradual decrease, but a, a, a step, a, a large step down. And then secondly, which um, tobacco products would this cover? I think you said smoke tobacco products, which means combustible. Well, maybe other people would think of it as combustible tobacco products, um, not heat, not the heated products. But if you can explain, yeah, um, tell us a bit more about um, that strategy. Sure. So the, the regulations which actually govern the implementation of the legislation have not yet been set out. That's the consultation process that I, I mentioned is underway at the moment. So uh, I just want to preface my comments by saying, you know, these are not official policy. This is just my anticipation of or, or what we've suggested um, might be an appropriate pathway. So, yes, we would want to see a rapid reduction in um, nicotine levels. So that we don't have a phase reduction. Instead, we have regular cigarettes one day and then we have very low nicotine cigarettes the next day. I don't know whether the ministry will have a phase in period, but that's certainly the approach that we are recommending. Um, the actual timing of the, the policy is denicotinization is actually the last of the three policies to be introduced. Again, we've recommended that it could be earlier simply because of the marked impact that I showed you in those modeling graphs, where really the denicotinization policy is what's going to bring about the rapid reduction in smoking prevalence. Um, but that's not the way that's been currently proposed at the moment. Um, Sorry, I've just forgotten the second part of your question, Joanna. Uh, yeah, so is the timeline and then what products it applies? Oh, the products that are covered, yeah. So unfortunately, it is just combusted tobacco products. At the moment, heated tobacco products are treated more as though they are like e-cigarettes. I mean, that's something that we have submitted should not be the case. And we've argued that heated tobacco products ought to be treated in the same way as combusted tobacco products. Um, but I'll have to wait and see uh, what, what the regulations actually say. But that's certainly the Aspire Group's recommendation to the ministry. Great. And then, um, so with the... Um, smoke-free generation would again would that apply no sales of even very low nicotine cigarettes or like what are you thinking would be included um in terms of not being allowed to be sold products? well very low nicotine cigarettes will be the only cigarettes that that are available so it will cover all combusted or smoked tobacco products so young people who are born on the 1st of January uh, 2009 or afterwards will never legally be able to be sold 
any tobacco product, any combusted tobacco product. Okay. So it would not apply to e-cigarettes or heated tobacco? That is a really interesting question. Um, I mean, many of us have argued that rather than having a smoke free generation, we ought to be much more ambitious and aim at having a nicotine free generation. Uh, that's certainly the view of many of my Maori colleagues. Um, and so that, that argument is, is being uh, debated at the moment. Yeah, there's so many, I mean, everyone is so excited and, and um, I'm trying to understand um, how all this will work. Um, Janet, at this point, what is the timeline? So this consultation and then when do we expect to know what the final sort of plan is, have the regulations in place? I, I can't really answer that question. All I can do is say that the consultation closes on the 15th of March. I mean, the ministry has been working incredibly hard and very quickly. Um, so I, I imagine that they are hoping to get the regulations issued um, very soon after that, but I, I'm afraid I can't speak to their exact timeline. Okay. And then could you... Um... Are there, I mean, you told us about the six um, foci of, of the plan. Is there, are there um, considerations of thinking about um, resources and sustainability for implementation, monitoring um, what the tobacco industry is, how they're responding, um, and also, I guess, resources also for um, education, um, mass media, one person asked about is our denormalization campaigns part of this. So sort of the resources for all the infrastructure. Is that discussed or are there um, yeah, are there opportunities for that currently? Well, uh uh, I mean, certainly in our submissions, uh, we've been arguing very strongly that um, that we need to have much greater resourcing to ensure that the community support is able to be provided and that uh, the groups that, that work with people among whom um, smoking prevalence is much higher, that they're in a position where they can reach out and provide the support that those people need to become smoke-free. So we've argued very strongly for that. We've also argued that we need to have more mass media campaigns a denormalization has not typically been an approach that's been used in Aotearoa, but it is absolutely time for us to be following that strategy. And really, the, the images that I showed from Shane Bradbrook's work, it, it's the only denormalization work that's been undertaken here. So I think because we've got an industry that is you know, making these ridiculous claims about transformation. Um, we, we need to expose the gap between what they're saying and what they're doing. And mass media denormalization seems to me to be a highly appropriate way to do that. Um, there will continue to be education and resources um, provided through school programs and those kinds of things. The industry is typically very supportive of that because we know it's a weak measure and it tends to reinforce uh, young people who are already smoke free, rather than changing the behaviour of those who are experimenting with smoking. So it can actually increase health inequities. So we, um, we are arguing for much more upstream than downstream measures. So um, supportful measures that will bring about and support the structural change rather than focus on individuals themselves. But certainly I hope that we see more social marketing and more denormalisation campaigns featuring. Thanks. And Aotearoa has um, very deep relationships with many of the Pacific Island nation states. I know you showed us some data as well, but didn't have a chance to, to point that out specifically. Do you know, are you aware of how these other countries in the region are considering um, what's, what, you know, this plan and if they're thinking of following suit, if they have even bolder ideas, more comprehensive, any, yeah, yeah, anything you could say about that? Well, there, there is a, a specific uh, goal of, of becoming smoke-free. Um, 
I, I can't speak to that in detail. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's not an area of, of, of research that I'm really familiar with, though uh, certainly some of my, my colleagues, uh, um, Sarah Hill, Jude McCall, people who I'm sure you know well, are actively working with those groups. So I think there is a very strong willingness to share the knowledge and expertise that we've been rapidly acquiring in Aotearoa and supporting our Pacific neighbours to achieve their ambitions as well. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, we're we're not going to have time for all the questions. I'm so sorry. They're great questions, but maybe um, again, I think you know people are really interested in how e-cigarettes do or do not play into plans for um, end game. And so, um, is there talk about whether there might be any truly medicinal um, e-cigarette? devices that are available. I don't know if you have sort of approved smoking cessation products that are de designated that way. No, that doesn't. No, um, they, they're not approved as, as medicines. As far as I know, no e-cigarette device has gone through our MedSafe approvals process. Um, so they can't be so to the best of my understanding, there, there's no brand that can be sold as a therapeutic product and can make um, make claims that you know about smoking cessation I think those claims um, are sometimes uh, made despite the fact that the approval process hasn't hasn't been gone through um, but at the moment e-cigarettes are sold as though they are consumer products they're widely available and it's a very different model for example to the um, the policy that's in place in Australia where these are prescription only products it's it's yeah they're just consumer products Okay, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. <laughs> I, I can't help myself. And that is, um, you know, just hearing more, if you can tell us very briefly about the rationale for um, a smoke free generation rather than a tobacco free generation. I know you've sort of expressed your personal um, thoughts about that, but it seems like this is going to be quite a long phase out still. Um, by the time everything happens, and and what were what were the arguments for strong going with the smoke free rather than the tobacco free? So by tobacco free, you mean nicotine free, including e-cigarettes and products like that. I I think um, the focus all along has been on smoking of combusted tobacco products is the most harmful way in which to to use nicotine. Um, I mean, at the time, I think we were probably so thrilled to see the smoke-free generation policy that we just didn't really follow Ruth's advice strongly enough. I mean, we just didn't imagine beyond that. And I think at the time, um, we didn't, we weren't focused on youth vaping prevalence in the way that we are today. And so I think if we were to go back and look at that policy now, uh, I would like to think that we actually took a different approach to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I think we have to end there. Thank you so much for um, sharing the plans and your your insights and sort of the 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 history and the rationale for um, what's happening. Uh, we look forward to um, implementation and then the evaluation research to find out more about you know um, how well this works and for whom and what might be left behind or not. And so thank you so much uh, for being here. Thanks everyone for joining us. And um, we do uh, put the recording up on our YouTube channel. So for those of you who have colleagues who weren't able to make it today, it will be available. So again, uh, Janet Hope, thanks so much for um, sharing this with us. Thank you.